So welcome to Happy Naked, the podcast. This is your host, Dee, and I'm the founder of Dee Health and Fitness, also the creator of Naked Feed Online Program and the author of Happy Naked, a straightforward five cents guide to loving the skin you're in and feeling that energy in every area of your life. I discovered in the last uh, few years that one of my missions in one of my missions in life is to bring to light taboo conversations, the naked truth of all true Roy stories. I want everyone to be happy in their own nakedness. And that is what we want to achieve with this, uh, every single one of the interviews and the people that I bring to the show. So Please follow me on social media as DMago Happy Naked uh, on Instagram. And you can also find me on Facebook under Naked Fit. It's all 100% health and fitness. And uh, you can also look for DMago Happy Naked on Facebook. And you'll find the page where you will see all these interviews um, that I get to do and also shared on uh, YouTube. So, and let me jump in into what we're going to talk about today. I have a wonderful guest. And and I also find that little by little, more wise parents are coming out, sharing their stories of guilt and shame. We all go through that. And as you heard many times from my previous shows, I'm a mom of three teenagers. They're 18, 15, and 13. (coughs) And I have been separated and divorced since 2012. I share my co- the custody of my kids with their dad. However, it doesn't make it any easier. It's no greener on the other side, and I thought it will be. And many people think it is greener on the other side after separation of divorce. It doesn't get any easier. I'm telling you this. So my, se- my separation and divorce had created a big impact in my kid's life. And I also felt guilty for years because of that decision of, um, you know, like separate. And, um, and yes, years uh, after I understood, um, because the guilt is coming from, after doing a lot of work on myself, I realized that I could have done something to fix my marriage. And uh, instead, um, at that point in time, back in, because 20, 2012, it's just basically the breaking point. However, if, we, if you, uh, like whoever is listening is in a relationship, understand that, you know, when you make the decision is not that in that moment, when it's a breaking point is the accumulation of years of, you know, like um, issues or misunderstanding or miscommunication. Um, And I'm not talking about extreme like abuse or anything like that. I'm just talking about normal relationship issues. And uh, and a lot of us think that it's greener on the other side. So separation might be the solution and it's not if we don't work on all those things. And I realized that later, right? And I, and I, you know, and I decided, of course, to work on that. And, um, and, and at the end of the day, it still impacted my kids and with the family dynamics, just the fact of making that decision, right? And um, still today, I look back and I think I could have done better. And that's where guilt takes place, right? I could have shared my message and provide more tools to help them thrive in life, even though they're still teenagers and still, you know, alive in front of them, hopefully. I could share more of my culture and tradition. I could let them connect more with my family. And the list goes on and on and on on how many things we can feel guilty <laughs> of <laughs> as parents. It's like, it's definitely never end. So it is, it is something that I learned to make peace with that, that there's no way I could go back. Decisions were made. And, and of course, um, the one thing I can tell, and this is a big advice from my experience, is that we always make the decisions uh, based on the knowledge that we have in that moment, according to the situation that we are experiencing. So bottom line, guilt is not going to get us anywhere, but we still feel guilty, (laughs) which is funny, right? And I'm sure Rosemary Rosemary is going to share a lot of that stuff, um, you know, about that. And this is, you know, and and that's um, who I want to introduce you guys today is Rosemary Hina, who will explain 
speak on her experience as a single mom and her feelings of shame and guilt in her journey and how she's overcome that and today having an amazing relationship with her daughter. So Rosemary calls her business Hard Powered Coaching, a name that signifies her purpose and personality. Rosemary is a mother and grandmother, which is an awesome place to be. She was a college professor of early childhood education for 31 years at St. Clair College in Windsor, Ontario. So we are from Canada. Woo <laughs> so Rosemary studied to be an integrative life coach with the late Debbie Ford, a New York Times best-selling author. After having her hands analyzed in, 20, uh, in 2007, Rosemary made a leap of faith to leave the college and develop her coaching business. Rosemary is also certified laughter yoga leader and hand analyst. She has been on an almost lifelong journey of self-awareness. She's happy to say that she finally found the answer she was looking for, and she loved to share those answers with others through her reading and coaching. And I met, I met Rosemary about three years ago through a network group. And, you know, funny enough, I got to say that her smile was very captivating, right? <laughs> and, um, and that's, I think, one of the things that I, I can say about, about her is that her presence it is you can you can feel it when you are in her presence so welcome rosemary Thank how you. are you doing i'm wonderful thanks very oh, good oh that's awesome thank you very much for saying yes to this and uh, and i'm so happy that we reconnect and um, that we're here together again we met here in calgary about three years ago and, uh, and, you know, here you are saying hell yes to this, <laughs> open to share a Roy story, which is, um, I hope, encourage a lot of people. And because um, at the end of the day, you know, people think that taboo, it's all about sex. And, uh, and definitely it's not it. It's taboo is everything that we are not willing to share and be raw about our stories, right? Being right. open sharing and then when we don't share it becomes a taboo because we're still repressing that part of our story and uh, so welcome welcome thank you thank you i'm i'm really happy to be here and and it's so funny because we when when you first asked me of course my mind went to the sex thing and and then and then i was thinking you know i just spontaneously came up well why didn't i talk about this because in my world people do not talk about this People hide the fact that they think they were a terrible parent. They feel all kinds of guilt and shame. Certainly I did. And um, I think it impacted me even more because in my career, I was teaching other people how to work with children. And yet right from the get-go, I always felt like I was a terrible parent. Yeah. So, um, you know, even though I could tell myself in my head, working with children that are not your own, in school settings, et cetera, which was what I was doing, is very different than parenting. There still was always this, I knew I wasn't doing the best job in the world and I didn't know what to do to make it better. So, yeah. So, so that, tell us, tell us how, how that, you know, how that was for you, because, um, you know, we're looking at guilt and shame. They're very low vibration emotions. Yes when we look at the list of different emotions, if people do not know about it, you can easily go and Google it, you yeah. know, emotions, admiration or energy, anything like that. And um, guilt, fear, and shame are one of the lowest yep. on, on the vibration of all the different emotions that we go through. And uh, which I'm not saying that is wrong. What I'm saying mm. is, because it's lower in the vibration, that's the impact that it creates in our decisions and, uh, and how we see life in general. So how do you, well, I would say the number one thing is what, when, when, or how do you realize that, you know, everything that you were doing, it was out of guilt or, or shame? Like, how do you find that out first? Well, 
so let me just explain about like the whole how this all started right because i um i didn't run away from home but i left home with the intention of severing my background i knew that i had to get out of the city where i was raised and be off on my own to be able to be me because being there i couldn't and i always felt like there was something wrong with me and um that you know so i left I, I went to university i was very fortunate that my parents were well enough off that they could afford to pay for that for me and i kind of drew a line in the sand and said either i go away to school or i'm going to work and pay my own way to go away from school so i did that and just as i was graduating from university my father passed away and i started a relationship and at that time i did not really consciously know how um i was looking for somebody to love me mm -hmm. i wasn't i wasn't mature enough to realize that there was so much more to relationships than that um but i the, so that's sort of like i'm still very very naive very secluded like sheltered upbringing and stuff like that so i get married at age 21 and i'm the oldest of seven children and i they're followed by three boys so in in that culture growing up i was the babysitter i was the help around the house a lot not that my other siblings didn't have to but i had the the job of being their babysitter too so i got married <laughs> And I, I'm like, okay, now I'm free. No, not at all, right? Because <laughs> wherever you go, you take yourself. And I had not. You just took another responsibility on your shoulders. Yes. I, I also chose to marry somebody who was blind. So that made it a little bit even more challenging than somebody else might experience. And um, I got pregnant really quickly, unintentionally using birth control but i got pregnant and it was one of those moments d it's one of those things like we've all had in our lifetime i'm sure even like right at the point of conception i knew i got pregnant even though i was practicing birth control and i've always said that this was intentional and i did not know at that time i didn't have any beliefs around reincarnation or planning or planning our life for anything like that i just knew my daughter was born for a reason because i shouldn't have gotten pregnant and also knowing like right at that moment i just conceived a child like i was so hooked right so hooked up at that moment so anyway so i have my daughter well she had colic i was in another city, I did not have a support system around me to turn to. And I was breastfeeding at a time. This would have, this was 1972. Breastfeeding was not popular back then. Very few people did it. So in the hospital, they were, they still had the nursing schools attached to the hospitals. They would bring classes in to watch me breastfeeding because it was so out of the norm. <laughs> I know it's probably hard to Wow, believe, that is crazy. Mm -hmm. hmm, something went, so natural. It went out of fashion for quite a while. So I've got this baby who, when we're together, she's got colic. I'm walking her, screaming, trying to comfort her, and nothing works, and just throwing my hands up. I don't know what to do. Yeah, it was it was really challenging. So um so anyway, so my relationship with my husband did not work out and we separated just before my daughter turned four. Well, with him being blind, it, you know, sharing, looking after her was a little bit more difficult when he wasn't living in my home. So we chose for him to move into a place very close to where I lived so that my daughter could go back and forth relatively easily. And for the first couple of years that worked and you may have experienced this too, I would find that her behavior during the week, she would go to him every second weekend for the weekend. 
her behavior during the week before she went to see her dad would get, it would, it would be harder for us to get along. And then when she went to see him, she came back, she was fine again. I had had a little break of a weekend. She would come back, she had had her time with her dad and we would get along really well for a while and then it would escalate again. Well, at some point he found someone who was much younger than him, who was very emotionally unstable and um, she didn't want my daughter around. And my daughter didn't tell me the kinds of things that were happening because she didn't want to not go to her dad. So I couldn't figure out why all of a sudden she was coming back worse than when she left. And so I'd get two days off and then I'd be back to single parenting and, you know, with a child that she, I mean, she's, a, she's an awesome kid. And as much as I could, given the kind of upbringing I had, I wanted her to have a better life than I had had. I wanted her to feel more love from me and I wanted her to be okay being herself. But I was raised where you do as you're told and you don't question it, right? And she was she was born with a, I'm gonna question everything. I'm not taking your word for anything if I don't agree with it. I wanna know the whys. And I didn't know how to manage that. So I would yell, I would, I wasn't much into physical um, hitting or stuff like that, but lots of yelling and lots of withdrawing when it got to be too difficult for me to manage. So she would escalate and then I would just let her have what she wanted because that would give me peace. So anyway, at, around, at, at about age nine, she came home one weekend from her, her visiting her dad in hysterics, could not calm her down. There was a really bad incident that had happened and I had to say, you just can't go there anymore. Like that's not safe for you. And um, so I stopped sending her and that's what the woman wanted, which was very good, right? So then after that, um, she never went anywhere. So it was always just the two of us. So it, it, it put a lot of stress, right? Plus she missed her dad, she wanted her dad. They didn't see one another very often. They only saw each other very infrequently when he wasn't with his with his wife, and um, and and that was really hard on her. Yes, and then course. she became a teenager, and at the time that she became a teenager, she asked him for something, and he got really angry and he cut her off and he didn't speak to her for five years. So wow. I've got this teenage kid who's just you know she she's she's dealing with all this stuff yeah going through I, all those things yeah like, uh, it's so just we're I adding the teenage hormones and life and figuring things out and then of course life it's there like yeah. that's that's part of life that's part of our our journey whether exactly. we don't want our kids to go through that right yes and i am uh, that is i had gone for counseling because i recognize that I needed counseling. So I had gone for counseling when I was married and it was an interesting phenomenon because as I started to get a little bit more healthy emotionally, my husband started having an affair with this, with somebody else, not the one that he ended up with later on, but with someone else who had a really disturbed background. So I started to put two and two together, especially by the time he, he ended up with the one he eventually married that this was what made him feel good was to be with women who needed him emotionally and, and looked on him as being their savior. And once I was starting to grow out of that, I wasn't playing my role in our, in our relationship any longer, right? So anyway, oh. so, so I did go for counseling. I went for counseling off and on throughout this time. And then there was a point at which the counselor that I was seeing that was helpful, um, stopped doing part of the practice that he was doing and I started working with someone else and that's when my daughter's behavior got a lot worse and um, when I talked to that counselor she suggested putting her on the waiting list to go to a treatment center and like I said when I was that's crazy I, I know I know totally crazy 
totally crazy. And fortunately, in order to go to that treatment center, she needed a psych assessment. And when the psychologist um, did the psych assessment, he spoke to me afterwards and he said, first of all, she doesn't have bad enough behavior, if you wanna say bad, um, to warrant going into treatment. Her, her, her issues are not severe enough to warrant going into treatment. And secondly, she is so attached to you that if you send her away, it will have a very negative impact on you. So I recommend, on her, I recommend that you get counseling. Yeah. So we so, both went to see someone. So what is a treatment center? A place where they would go and live in residence. So it's like for crazy people? No, for, for children with um, behavior or mental, mental, emotional issues and stuff like that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is yeah, really, really severe, really severe. Um, anyway, very bad advice, which fortunately I didn't take. Well, I, I couldn't take because they wouldn't have accepted her. But we went the route of, of um, working with a social worker. And um, they suggested at the practice where I had already been seeing a social worker that she see someone else so that she would have somebody that would be her special person that she would feel confident with. And so through, that helped a lot. So we, we started to have a little bit better things in place. But all this time still, I'm not very effective at being a mom with a, with a child like her. So anyway, I, I, honest to God, I, I loved her to pieces. Always have, right? She loves me to pieces. We could not get along. <laughs> We just rubbed each other the wrong way. We triggered um, one another. It was awful. But that's part of the journey. I know. Oh, I and, know and, and, and yeah. you know, and yeah. I got to say that, um, you know, there, there is, and I, I can relate to a lot of bits and pieces that you have shared in my personal life, not necessarily between me and my kids, it's more between me. So there, there, are, there are a few things, right, that I can definitely look at it and say it is the same thing my mom my mom and i are completely from two different my mom had three kids and i'm the oldest and uh and, and funny enough my mom had me when she was 21 and that uh, same thing like she has to learn a lot of different things and um and then my dad was the one that was cuckoo and uh and and then when she separated him i was four years old Oh, you wow. know, I have a lot to relate to with your daughter, honestly. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, what I, what I can see is that, yeah, like I can see the difference between my mom and I. And, um, and then, but in my, in my case, I don't really know how much work my mom has been doing. Yeah. I, I don't want to put her on the spot because she's not here to defend herself. <laughs> However, and uh, I am the one that have to do a lot of that work to figure out how to deal with her, right? And that uh, where she come from, it's her story. And whenever she's ready to deal with that, then that's her call. But on my end, I'm, I'm the one that have to take responsibility of that part, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it is a very, very interesting, everything that you have been sharing, because if I can relate to uh, all the bits and pieces that you're sharing, I'm sure there's more people that can share, um, can, can relate to, to what you're sharing today with us. And that's what I want, right? I want, you know, your story to encourage and, um, and, and give us ideas, because I think yeah. at the end of the day, it is your path is different than what we chose or the tools that we chose might be different. All we care is that we get to the same, you know, uh, finish line, meaning uh, fixing or overcoming or growing or whatever the case is, right? And that's, I think, what's the ultimate goal for each one of us is just to get to the next level of, you know, becoming who we are today, right? Yes, yes. But I'm absolutely. sure it wasn't easy. No, it's it's never been easy. It it, it really hasn't. Um, and, you know, like many people, when I, I think most people can relate to feeling like there's something wrong with you. I believe in this lifetime, we chose to come into this world 
and experience the world through the lens of um, like totally disconnected from who we really are and unable to remember the power that we have. Um, and so everything I was doing, I was doing from a place of my core belief was I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of love, all those kinds of things. So I'm trying to find love outside of me to get it, which leads to attracting terrible relationships, especially with men, right? Because I'm looking for something rather than being the person that I want to be with stuff I didn't know, right? Like you said early on, like you do the best you can with what you have as knowledge at the time, right? You, you can't do any more than that. That's all we can do. So fortunately, I kept working and working and working. And every now and again, I'd find something that would help. Certainly when I started to work with Debbie Ford, that was a significant turning point in my life. I met Debbie in 1999. And that was a huge um, shift for me because I started to see things in a different perspective. She taught me about even the things that we're ashamed of. If we would own that we are those things, instead of trying to stuff them down, we would be able to use them to our advantage when they are called upon and they won't be running us. We'll be in charge of them. That was huge for me to make that shift. Um, people around me noticed and commented that I became a happier person after that. So fortunately, I've had 22 years that have been more on the upswing <laughs> or 21 years more on more on where I want to be, right? More on the person I want to be. Um, I'm 70, 71, almost 72. So it's never too late, people. <laughs> it's really never too late. And, and how old is your daughter now? She's 48. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's been yeah. a long journey. It's been a long journey. When, when do you notice that your relationship with the, your daughter, because now you have a granddaughter, right? Or a grandson. Grandchild. grandson. Oh, grandson. Do you yeah. have only one child? Yeah. Okay. One, one child, one grandson. Oh, okay. Awesome. So, so when do you think after, you know, starting to learn what you know today, and uh, when do you think your relationship with your daughter? Because I think I'm looking for the hope, right? That we yeah. all hope that eventually a relationship with our mothers or our daughters or sons, it will improve over the years as long as we do the work. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen like you snap your fingers and then here we are. It required hard work. And what I always say is um, we definitely need to face our demons. Absolutely. For those weird low vibration emotions and uh, so, but when do you think it's when you started noticing that your relationship with your daughter started to get a little better, that you could see the hope, oh, you could see the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, it, it, it started, it started when she, she went away to university, she went to, she moved back to the city where I grew up and um, did her school and her education there, her university. And um um, she came home one time with her husband, she got married, and um, I don't know, I can't remember if they were married or they were just living together at that point, but she came home with him one time, and I was spectacularly horrible. I blew up over stuff, and um, uh, so they were going to leave without staying. It was, it was like Christmas or Thanksgiving or something, I think Christmas maybe. They were leaving, and then her husband came back, and he said, you know what, like you treat her terribly. You really don't, you, you aren't nice to her. Um, and he really spoke up on her behalf and I listened. And um, I asked him, please go get her. Let's talk about this, the three of us. And we did. And so I heard from her point of view, the things that I was doing that were, were heart hurting her. And I took responsibility for that. And I did my very best after that to change. And um, so that, that would have been when she was, let's let's say 22, somewhere around there, somewhere in that point, at that point. And then things got better over time, but really it's been in the last year 
um, I started to work with a man and um, I, I brought his book so I could share it with people. Break Yourself Help Addiction by Brian D. Ridgway. And awesome. I'm going to put that in the comments yeah, so people can comments. go and search for it, okay? For sure. So then, yeah. Um, yeah. So then oh. people know if they're interested, right? Right. Um, Brian has a completely different paradigm of the universe. And so I, I read this book four years ago and I started at that point to um, work with Brian in small groups. And then last year I was fortunate enough to work with him twice in person. And he does what he calls spell breaks. And that is to break that, um, break the, the spell that we are under and we're under millions of them probably that um, that's keeping us from experiencing the life we want. And he shares the, the, the paradigm that we are infinite unlimited beings. We project out of eternity into the illusion of time and space to have experience. We, we don't remember who we really are because if we did, we'd just be able to bounce right back and we wouldn't have the experiences. So it's important to have this experience in this lifetime from all the perspectives that we have and awesome that we don't have to spend all of our lives like that because he can do something about it and remember who we really are. So we did some work together that just took some of those spells away and you know, one of the things that we worked on was the fact that here I've left, I've, I've gone away from what I wanted to get away from to be myself. And then I jump into a marriage that, you know, was not based on a, on what a healthy relationship is going to be. And that's on me. And as well as my husband, obviously we contracted to, to have that relationship together and for me, for us to birth our daughter and, um, what happened because I got pregnant so quickly was I went from being the, the second in command at home with the six younger brothers and sisters to being responsible for an infant. And I never really got that time on my own to, to be who I wanted to be with you no know, to grow and to, and to develop and everything like that. So, you know, my daughter chose to have me as her mom we chose to have this experience together. And somehow just in that, in that session with Brian and all the work I've done with them over the last four years, um, I shed some of the stuff. I stopped that, it just broke the spell. That, I can't say anything different about what happened. It broke that spell and I was able to come home. My daughter picked me up at the, um, at the train station, I went to visit my siblings for Christmas and my daughter picked me up when I came back um, at the train station and we sat down and we must've talked for about three hours that day. And uh, it was just, it was so fantastic. I could explain those things to her. I told her a little bit about why her dad and I broke up, which I had never shared with her before. And, um, you know, I'm not blaming him or anything like that, but it, it helped her to have a little bit more perspective on what I was going through at the time. So, you know, you said something that is really interesting and I want, as a mom, I'm doing the work because I think I, the work I do, and, and you call it a spell, and then I know other people call it programming. It really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, yeah. it is the same freaking thing that we have in our brain, our DNA, whatever, right? And um, however, I the work I do, I, I understand that it will create an impact on my kids' future, right? Because I'm clearing a lot of that crap that, you know, it's, I am fortunately passed on to my kids through birth. And, yep. um, and then of course it's coming from, you know, my, my mom, my grandma, my dad and all that kind of stuff, right? So, but what do you think it will, because as you're speaking, I'm here analyzing as well, right? Because um, as a daughter, I'm the one doing the work. And uh, for myself, I wonder if my mom 
or the mom, right? Because I'm as a mom, I'm doing the work for my kids. As a daughter, I feel that I'm doing the work for myself. Because I also think that my mom have to do the work as a mom. What what do you think? Uh, do you get what I'm trying yeah, to get to? Yeah, sure. So what sure. what are your thoughts about it? Because in your case, you took responsibility as a mom, right? And yeah. uh, and of course, your daughter will have to do her work as a daughter, as an individual as well, in order to be able to break that pattern. You already clear some, but she still have to clear some more uh, for her son. Mm -hmm. So what do you think it's, you know, all that flow, it's impacting us? Okay, so there's only really now, right? Any change, I believe anything that we can do will heal forward and backwards. So I come from a family of alcoholics. My daughter became an alcoholic and she, uh, um, five years ago now, approximately. Oh yeah, five. she's passed five years now. Five years ago, she asked me if I would go to her first AA meeting with her. And I said I would, and I went to the meeting and I stopped drinking that day too, because I said, I already was feeling like I had shame around how much I was drinking and, and I was feeling like I couldn't give it up. So I was, I just said, that's it. You know what, if I want to help her, I need to not drink too. And that will be more supportive for her. So I stopped drinking six years ago. It took her longer to get past it. Um, but she did five plus years ago and she's not not had a drink since and neither have I so so I believe that that's going to heal addiction in my family line we're not going to pass it on because we're stopping and I think that we affect all the people around us backwards and forwards so I think you doing the work on you at least what's going to happen is that you're going to be fine with your mom and then whether she wants to do the work that it would take on her part, who knows? But like you said, like it, it's definitely going to go down to your children for sure. And like you said, it's in our DNA, right? So the, all those patterns, all those things that we have inherited, we can change our DNA and, and they will no longer be passed on. So, and, and you're, you're saying something interesting that um, it's something that I'm, I'm learning more and more, or I guess it's sinking in more and more over the, the last few years, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, my journey started about, uh, I think, 12 years ago, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then little by little, right, I believe uh, expanded or, or my growth was exponential unfortunately after my separation yeah okay and i'm saying unfortunately because it's sad right uh, to me it is sad that we have to go through a breakout a breakout in order to grow but it, it's part of the journey right yeah and uh so but anyway so my growth has you know been exponential and um and i would say even in the last six years right five to six years that it's been like whoa Okay, yeah. and um, and the fact that we <clears throat> have the power to change our DNA, I think, is still very taboo for a lot of people, oh. or unknown, or yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. Uh, we can, you know, it's something that I don't really think a lot of people truly understand the Probably power not. they have over their life and how to change those things. Yeah. So understanding what a lot of people that might be watching this, right, is still like, oh my God, what about changing our DNA and all that kind of stuff? What do you think it was? Um, you know, you have shared a lot of things already, right? And But I wanna emphasize this. What was, do you think the biggest thing that you felt it really started creating that big shift within yourself. Well, it's been the four years of working with Brian, really, mm. because everything else is based on different paradigms. So the paradigm that we are not 
even even the paradigm that I'm not a spiritual being having a human experience. I am infinite, unlimited power. We you know, are they're, they're, all one. There's no one out there. It just looks like people are out there and they're reflecting back to us everything that we have inside of us, what we think and believe that we know, but we're not conscious of what we think and believe that we know until we see it in the outside world. And if we if we see it in the outside world and we go, oh, that's bad, that's awful, this happened to me, whatever, which is how I used to think, I can't do anything with it. But from the point of view of how is this the best thing that ever happened for me, I will find the answer. And I can find an answer that will give me so much insight and so much freedom that I'm not gonna have to meet that same experience again. I had in every single solitary relationship that I had with a man, except for one, the man cheated on me. Always, 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 always. So I obviously believed I wasn't lovable, that I wasn't deserving of having a a one-on-one -on -one relationship that was good, none of that. So I had to keep repeating the experience until I was able to finally look and say, I created that. I'm the one that believed that. I'm the one that created that experience. Nobody else. I'm not a victim. I created it. You know, and I, and I appreciate everything that you're saying. I also want to mention that in one of my previous episodes, I have a guest, it is anonymous, that is talking about our, our addiction. And he basically shared um, a very deep and profound learning, his learning, right, from his experience about addiction. And, um, and he's been clean uh, for a while already, but it's definitely, I think it's, it's, it's nicely uh, coming together with what you're sharing as well, because all these different experiences, how they can lead to addiction. And one of the things I saw him, um, I saw him on, on Sunday and we were talking about it. He was asking me about how was his interview and all that stuff. And, um, and one of the things that he said is, and it's pretty much, Attach, and that's why I mentioned this because I want people to watch this interview and also watch that addiction um, uh, interview because one of the things that he talked about it is how the lack of love and emotions led him to addiction. Sure. And of course, his dad was addicted and it was all like it goes, you know, it's pretty much linked. It's just that he expands on that. And, um, and it is, and I would love people also to connect this interview and this show with that previous one, because I think it's going to start putting bits and the pieces together when it comes about growth and elevating and coming out of those places. There is another thing I want to mention, uh, which is um, support. So basically, I'm, I'm putting in one place support and coaching. When you look at what was the biggest um, oh, yeah. shift in this growth, and that which I'm going to say that also lead to being part of a tribe, yes. being part of a community, yes. being part of something. Because I think um, I, I was having an, a conversation with another friend of mine who um, him and I are part of this uh, Love Vibration Society and, um, and he's facilitating some meditation as well and stuff like that. And then uh, the one thing that we, after a conversation that we're, we kind of nailed down is that a lot of people feel alone, mm -hmm. that they're alone in this journey. Yes. And, um, and it, it's linked to what you said just now. It is support and coaching is having that yeah. support. And, you know, I, it's, um, and if I translate that to fitness, it is everybody think they can exercise on their own. Mm -hmm. Everybody think that they don't need a personal trainer. But what I represent in that situation is the support the coaching and the tribe that you yeah. need in order to succeed and reach your goals. Yeah. 
And, uh, and, and, and I think that's another thing that um, we all go through where we think that we can do this alone. Yeah. Like, uh, because it's, it's shameful. It's shameful to share, you know, you said earlier, you were screaming at your daughter. Like you were, you have this kind of behavior that is shameful. Yeah. Because you don't want, we, no one wants to admit that we were screaming and we lost our temper with our kids, which I also have done that, right? It's, it happened to me as well. And, uh, and it's, it's about sharing, opening, being vulnerable, you gotta be you, and you said that at the very beginning, you have to learn to be, you know, I have to learn to be me. I'm gonna quote you on that. And, um, and then in, you also said something interesting about looking for someone to love me. How yeah. many people out there are looking for love outside of themselves? Yeah, everybody mostly, until you Every come to the realization that it doesn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work. But we don't know that, right? Because we're never taught that. Yeah. We're never and taught that. To, hundred percent. Hundred percent. And 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 sometimes it also comes with the fact that if we didn't feel the love, because and I'm going to also um say that I think I want to think that all parents love their kids and sometimes i doubt that with all the stories i hear but i i, I truly would love to think that every when we become parents you know we we love our kids and again it goes back to we do it in the best of our knowledge sure and uh, and sometimes the best of our knowledge is that also what we learn from our parents yeah exactly across our genetics our D, what it's in our DNA, and um, and I'm going to to even share something on this that I realized how strong my DNA is because uh, after a conversation, I'm going to share this quickly, right before we start closing this. And uh, last year, uh, I, I had a, we had a family reunion. We all met in Mexico. A family came from Venezuela. We came from Canada. We all met in Mexico. We've done uh, that twice already. And, um, and in my last one, which was December 2019, um, I was speaking with my uncle. And I'm sharing a bunch of stuff. And for some reason, my relationship with my dad is not the greatest. That's why I can relate to your daughter quite well. And, uh, and then it was started talking about my dad for some reason. And I, that's when I realized why I always felt like the black sheep in the family. Because I am more like my dad when it comes to behavior, but I didn't grow up with him. I did. I guarantee you that I didn't learn that behavior from him because it wasn't. Ex I wasn't exposed to that behavior, right? Yep. And it's in my freaking DNA, and I'm like, <laughs> no way. But that's that's. Those are the things, and of course. When I see my mom and I see my sister, I am almost five years older than my sister. And, and then I have, you know, I have other siblings, but then from my mom, it is, you know, my sister and they have another brother who I'm 15 years older than him. And um, I'm completely different than those two, completely different. And I'm completely different than my mom because I grew up with my mom, my grandma, and my great grandma and my sister. Then 15 years later is when my brother, you know, came in our, in our life. But, but for the first 15 years of, I would say 11 years of my life, it was just surrounded by, by this circle of women, right? And uh, I never learned a lot of stuff from my dad. And here I am having a conversation, like 42 years later, after I was born, and realizing that it's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a learned behavior. Yeah. So how strong that is. Yeah. But we only can get out of that place if we want to fix it. Yes, you need to have the desire of 
fixing it, right? With support and coaching and a tribe. Mm -hmm. We need somebody so, with a different point of view because, you know, it, it's like that quote from Einstein that you can't solve a problem that you've created from the same level of thinking at which you created it. So if, if all we know is creating the problem, we need someone else to come along with a completely different, well, not completely different, but a different point of view to cause us to look at things from a different angle. So what do you want your, your message to be, your closing message to be for people out there that, and I want to emphasize in these two emotions because they're not good and at the same time they're normal to have, which is guilt and shame. How can, what do you think is going to help these people to get out of that place? And I think ask help. Okay, me. so what do you think? The only thing I can say is what I believe to be true now is that there's nothing wrong with any of us. We're all perfect. We had the intention to have these experiences, to be the way we were, but we don't know that. We don't remember it. And we're filled with programming that you know what, like when from a very early age, you're bad, you're, you are responsible for this with that wagging finger and your face about being responsible, being bad, but re being responsible being means being able to respond. And so when I can look at it and say, I am doing this, this is me creating this, I can take responsibility and do something about it. And I can also know that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I don't have any um, regrets because I'm a human being, right? I feel some regret, but I don't feel shame or guilt any longer. And I haven't for quite some time. That actually passed even before I met Brian. I mean, the, the, the most aware part of myself, that had gone. And now I think what happened in the spell breaks with him was the part that was still deep, deep seated underneath was released so that I know to just be, you know, and, and it doesn't mean I, I haven't ever said I'm sorry to her and I continue. I've said it recently over something else. You know, if I taught you that, I'm really sorry. That was what I knew when. I was with you as, you know, when I was raising you, um, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that I did, because I didn't know how to express my own emotions, when she was having her outbursts or whatever, I was so uncomfortable with it. I tried to shut it down because it was too hard for me to handle. And so that was one of the biggest things that I apologized for, because you know what, we need to be able to feel and express our emotions and let them come up and come out and go away. But if you don't know how to how to do that, or you're so uncomfortable because you've been shut down, somebody else's outbursts are, are very terrifying to you. So have compassion for yourself and understand you really were doing the best you could. <laughs> you really were. And you can always make amends. And I, and I mean, I really believe that's true. Like I can just, I can be present with her. I can be loving and kind and, and I can recognize if I'm not being present with her, which I've done lots in the past. Now I check, you know what, are you really paying attention to her on the other end of the phone or are you doing something else? Stop doing whatever you're doing and just be present to her but you gotta be able to be present to yourself to be present to someone else in that manner, right? So I had That's to feel what I needed to feel. I had to love myself and continue because it, it's an ongoing process, but um, yeah. So be kind, be loving to yourself. You did the best you could and you always have that opportunity. Even if the person's passed, you can still talk to them in spirit and, and do amends making if that's what needs to take place. And just to say, you, you did mention about my daughter needing to do the work. I have, to, I have to say she has worked very, very diligently on herself. 
Um, going to AA was a very good move on her part because she learned how she was thinking and she's correct, corrected a lot of how she thinks and how she behaves. So she's made herself a far more lovable person as a result of her recovery process. You know, and, 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 and uh, I even think that being present with their kids, being present with herself, it's a topic by itself. Oh, for sure. These days, right? But definitely. So thank you very much for, um, you know, as I said earlier, for saying yes to this. And, uh, and I want to mention where people can find you. So you can email her at Rosemary Heenan, H-E-E-N-A-N, at gmail.com. You can find her on Facebook under Hard Power Coaching. And, uh, and you can Google her, Rosemary Heenan, and you'll find her. And I also want to remind every one of you to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, find all this amazing, um, you know, information that I have here to share with you because the whole purpose and my mission, it is to elevate uh, the vibration of each one of you by bringing all these conversations that a lot of us don't dare to talk about. And, um, and I'm bringing a lot of people in this show that have never shared their stories before until I ask. And, um, and, and I think that's the power of, um, I'm gonna brag about it, but that's the power of my influence to ask people and people trusting me by saying yes to this. So this is a good bragging. And um, absolutely, it's just being honest. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, and that's what it is. And I want and I'm bringing people to the show that are normal people like you and me and many others that have been in the show because our our stories are real and that we don't have to be. Um, you know, all these celebrities that have, you know, all this massive level of following, because I also want to make sure that um, we, we can do the work, whether we're a celebrity or not. And it's, uh, it's we are, and you mentioned responsibility. It is our responsibility to take control of our growth. So thank you very much, Rosemary. It is amazing. And, uh, and please follow Rosemary and, uh, and follow me on their Happy Naked. You will find all these interviews on the YouTube channel as well. You'll find me on BeatChute as well. And, and of course, follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And, um, and there's all the information is there. All the stories are there. And um, it, because it's, it's wonderful. It is about this time more than ever. We need to, um, to speak, to stand up, and, uh, and get our power back. So this is the time and we're all doing our work, which is the whole collective growth as a community, as a tribe. And, uh, and I'm so happy because Rosemary, you have been doing an amazing job and you're an amazing inspiration for everyone. Because no matter how old we are, uh, the most important thing is take responsibility, take action, find your tribe, and you know, love yourself. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. You're welcome.